environments of higher for longer. And that's just the way that that it's going to be. We're not going to be, you know, in that forty fifty dollar range, uh, at least for I would say the next, you know five to seven years, most likely. And th that does sound a little bit far out, but you just have to look at the dynamics uh, that are happening. And what is happening, what we are seeing is that really we're seeing demand growth still in the sector when we weren't supposed to be seeing demand growth, right? We, um, you know, we were supposed to see peak oil demand by, you know, by by now, and we certainly haven't seen that. And growth is only supposed to get larger. And the problem is we don't have, we haven't had CapEx for the last seven years, right? And nobody's incentivized to drill anymore because you have all these governments saying they want to phase you out by 2030. And so we have a problem where you're going to have increased demand and less supply. And that's just, a, that's the fact of what it is. And even if the West moves, say, you know, Europe and the United States move to uh, limit their use. That's only a billion people. There's another seven billion people <laughs> on the planet. Um, and uh, and two billion of those are in emerging markets that don't even have access to electricity at this point. And so their consumption, you know, you can't expect them to leapfrog technology and go straight into, say, wind and solar. It's expensive. It's intermittent. And it's expensive and intermittent. You can't use it as a base load. And so, you know, you've got a lot of demand that's coming up and that's great because we want to lift these people out of poverty just as we were lifted out of po poverty with fossil fuels. So it's just not going away and we just don't have the supply coming online that we need to. And so really that's the backdrop that we're looking at, you know, definitely over the next five to seven years. Yep. Bottom line is like serious macro tailwinds that's the yes. that's that's the bottom line right. um in plus i mean you... correct me if i'm wrong but all the mining that needs to be done to to fuel the 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 green revolution you know or the, the exactly. green energy i mean that's going to take a lot of oil right uh, yeah absolutely mining is extremely energy intensive um, and, and that's a whole, you know, mining is a whole nother issue, but yeah, it's extremely energy intensive. So it's going to take fossil fuels just to get the metals to make the green technology. So, um, you know, I just don't foresee a scenario at any given point where we're going to need less fossil fuels, not more making this transition. It almost like they forgot about that part. <laughs> like it takes, <laughs> it takes oil to, to make even the green stuff, right? Uh, so, yeah. um, Ian, Ian, I was hoping you could just maybe pull up a chart and sort of just, uh, you know, from a technical perspective, just set the stage and sort of, I know we talked about this on either Wednesday or last Friday, but uh, just set the stage for, for where things stand technically in oil right now. Well, from a technical perspective, uh, the, the range is between uh, 6250 and 115. You know, 115 uh, coincides with the shelf of former highs. You know, uh, from you know 20, 2011, 2012, uh, 2013. Uh, and then you know, those highs that we experienced last year. Uh, it you know broke out, broke out of this uh this basing formation um and ran into resistance right around that 93 and a quarter level. You know, that's you know a, a polarity zone. Um, here highlighted by those those pivot lows from when you know uh, crude oil pulled back after that spike uh, when war broke out in Europe, and then that same level acted as resistance late last year. So back to the scene of the crime around ninety three and a quarter. I think once we get back above there, maybe one fifteen. I mean, does, does that seem reasonable, Tracy? I think it's entirely possible. I mean. We really don't, you do really don't want spiking energy prices because that's bad for everybody, right? It's just, it's a drag on everybody's economy because it makes everything more expensive because everything runs on energy. And so we really don't want to see uh, spiking energy prices, but certainly um, I think we can get above a hundred. Absolutely. Um, and I, yeah, go ahead, Ian. No, please go ahead. Well, what I was going to ask Tracy is like, because you obviously know like way, way, way more about this stuff than I do. And uh, oil is being as, as headline sensitive as it is. I, I'm just curious, like what, where is your attention right now? Just from a headline perspective, as far as 
um, headlines that you suspect will drive price, at least in the short term, long term, different story. But but uh, we kind of covered that. But short term, where should my attention be as someone that 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 doesn't pay attention as, as closely as you guys do? Well, I think, you know, going heading into the end of the year, we already had the big OPEC announcements. We already had the big OPEC cuts by Saudi Arabia out to the end of December. So I think we're probably um, unless we see another war or something, you know, catastrophic, uh, I don't think really see that many that many more headlines coming out. Now, there has been talk in the U.S. about releasing more of the SPR, uh, but realistically, they can't. Uh, they can't really dump that much more from the SBR without uh, hurting the integrity of the SBR. I mean, at this point, they're going to be pulling up brine water, not oil, because that's what they use to displace it, right? So the cavern walls don't fall down. Um, so really, there's not really a lot, you know, they can't do another 200 million barrels, and they can't technically empty it because you, you it, it would uh, you'd be pulling up water you'd just be pulling up brine water so you know whether or not that comes to fruition obviously people are watching to see if that happens but generally when we do see that happen you get a, kind of a push down in oil prices like after a big SPR uh, announcement you get a push down in prices but then you know prices always rise thereafter um, because it's not a long-term fix. <laughs> that, that that's sort of what I was alluding to with the uh, the SPR and just like how likely that that is or if it's just noise. Yeah, it's pre- it's yeah. pretty much okay. noise. It's gonna you know it's okay. not a long term fix. I mean we yeah. the, we had to dump two hundred and ten million barrels um, to push oil prices down. You know, to twenty bucks for yep. you know a little bit of time, but yep. you know so. Okay. Um, and I, I don't want to only talk about oil today because I know you, of course, follow the whole commodity space and and so does Ian. So, I mean, maybe we can talk about, about that at some point as well. Uh, just so, And if you have a question in the chat, by the way, drop it in there. I am watching the chat. So, uh, you know, we can always ask Tracy anything that, that, that you guys want to talk about. Um, gosh, wait, what was I about to say about oil? I just had a thought and uh, it's escaping me. Oh, my goodness. I, you um, know, I was, what are your thoughts on the crack spread? Um, in terms of seeing demand for the distillates and 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 how how you see that affecting uh, crude oil prices in the coming uh, weeks and months? Because yeah. right now, I mean, it it it, it seems range bound. I'll pull up a chart here. Yeah, pull up a chart. But it's elevated, right? So it's it elevated. You know, it, it. Yeah, I just exactly. want to know what you're reading. It's elevated. On. We have come off the highs, which is a, a a good thing, but we're still much higher than historical averages and historical norms by any means and we do have we have a diesel shortage um globally once again right just like we did in summer of 2022 well actually we had it was 2021 and 2022 where we had um shortages but and then you just had a rush up full uh pull diesel and gasoline exports right to, for an un- unknown period of time. And unfortunately, that does really particularly affect Europe because they bought a lot of diesel from, from Russia because you, you, can, you can still buy oil and gas as long as it's not pipelined in. <laughs> so the sanctions are only against pipeline oil and gas So and not so much products. So uh, it, it, in return, that actually should help refiners. And if you saw the other day when they made that announcement, we did see diesel refiners in the U.S. spike. Um, probably that that was the only bright spot the other day in the whole oil patch were refiners, because um, that's good news for U.S. refiners as they try to source elsewhere. And so, um, you know, that is, you know, particularly, and we don't have enough refining capacity globally. So, you know, I think refiners will do very well if you're trading, uh, you know, oil equities. Um, I kind of was, when those cracks came up, I kind of uh, pulled back a little bit from those, but with this announcement with Russia um, ending exports, I think that we'll see uh, refiners do, diesel refiners, distillate refiners do well. Yeah, actually, just, that's interesting because right now oil services or oil services have have been leading the the energy uh, space in terms of uh, yeah. sort of the stock market. So keep an eye on on refiners potentially would, taking yeah. on a leadership role here in the coming months. Absolutely, very cool. Especially yeah, 
depending on how dire this diesel situation gets, right? But we are heading into winter where we need these heavier uh, fuels. And we're now seeing, you know, uh, China just opened up international travel. And so we're seeing jet fuel demand really increase uh, out of Asia. Uh, so just something to keep your eye on. You know, I, I do like diesel refiners at this point. That was actually my question because we talked, Ian and I talked last week about sort of, you know, the haves and the have nots from the equity side of, of the market, but you sort of answered that. Um, yeah. So I guess like, uh, the, you know, here's a question from the chat from uh, Jonathan, just sort of about the, or from John about the profitability of the majors. Uh, and, and, and I guess like that, I guess that's the, that's the question from their perspective, I would, I, I would suppose, but do you have any thoughts on, on, on the majors? I mean, I think the majors will do well, particularly those that focus on their core business, oil and gas, right? We just saw Shell kind of shy away, kind of back off of their green plans a little bit because they were not doing as well as, say, you know, Exxon and uh, CBX, right, that are more focused on their core business. And so, and we saw BP back off a little bit too. And so, you know, I think that the majors will do well. They're very diversified. I think when you particularly, you're looking in the United States, I think M&A is definitely not done yet. And so I think you're going to still see majors um, kind of swallowing up some smaller players as, you know, t top tier acreage kind of gets scarce. Speaking of uh, Shell, I mean those uh, those some of the ads that I saw were really weird. Like Shell and <laughs> um, and who was it? Like Philip Morris jumped out to me as being like two of, like the the ES like firms focused on ESG that really went out there, right? Like yes. you know Shell, we're not an oil company. Philip Morris, we're not a cigarette company. Right. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, you are. And so, yeah, well, right. and, you know, and that's why we kind of saw kind of a 180 from Shell right. just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I, I've been a full disclosure Shell shareholder for quite a while. Um, and yeah, so I just thought that was like super weird. Um, which is what about other, other parts of the commodity complex? I, I mean, obviously all of it has our attention because we've been talking, we've been, like I said, we've been doing our best to not just talk energy and there's right. a lot of other stuff to talk about, um, you know, in the space, but like, what else has your attention right now? So I think metals, you know, metals have come down way off the highs from summer of 2022 when everything spiked because energy spiked. Energy's been performing very well, but metals and miners haven't been performing as well. And so with this pullback, you know, I think it may be time to start looking at some miners again and some of these basin industrial metals. Ian, thoughts? Yes, absolutely. Um, copper, copper above $4. Um, yeah. Uh, I just, I think it's really interesting to see that, that, um, I guess just to see the 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 the, the dislocation between the pro-cyclical areas of the commodity space. Right. Um, you know, energy's catching higher and in 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 these base industrial metals can't seem to get it going. I do have a question for you. Um be, before we run out of time. There's a couple of markets that you know I've been I've been uh charting uh with crude oil. One of them is palm oil. Do you see any any kind of relationship in terms of you know demand in these markets? No, that's real. I actually haven't compared it to palm oil. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> I think it's an, uh, that's very interesting. Um, you know, I don't know if that's a function of um, how it's processed how much energy is used and how it's processed. I really, unfortunately, don't know that much about the palm oil market, but I would think that it's probably, you know, due to maybe a function of how much energy that it's, that is used to produce that particular product. Yeah, I'm, I might be getting a little too creative here. Um, I, I think it's interesting. What, what about wheat? Is, so, is, is, does, yeah. does crude tend to lead wheat or is it the other way around? I think wheat is the craziest agricultural product that you can possibly try to <laughs> trade, nice. to, be, to be honest with you. It's very erratic. Yeah. Um, you know, it's nothing like 
corn where, you know, that's, I think that's a little bit of a uh, easier trade and it's more seasonal. I mean, Chicago wheat's kind of like the redheaded stepchild, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, you know, I don't uh, trade wheat that, that often, but certainly, um, you know, I think that has a lot to do, you know, fundamentally with, I think, um, the competition that we have with Russia, Ukraine, because of those are such large grain markets. Yeah, and those uh, corridors, they're trying to keep those corridors open, correct? We, we've um, only got a, a couple minutes Yeah, they left. made a humanitarian uh, corridor. The problem is, is that the, obviously it's a war torn country, unfortunately, sadly, so um, we'll probably see less uh, production from them in the next couple of years. At least that's what the expert agriculture people that I talk to. We've got a couple minutes left here, so I want to get to this question from the chat from BN Cruz. Uh, how soon will nuclear energy help the short supply of fossil fuels? Well, I, you, I, so, you know, a, I'm all a, pro. That's a big I'm question. All, I know. I'm all pro. How much time do you have, Bian? I'm, I'm pro uranium. Obviously, you know, we are saying, you know, there's there are a lot. If we look at Asia, that's where the real growth has been over the last 10 years and um, projects that are already in the pipeline. The good news is we are starting to see because after, you know, in the West, we started to have this shy away from after the Fukushima disaster particularly in Europe. I mean, U U.S. still has a lot of nuclear capacity, way more than Europe does. Um, you know, and you still see co countries like Germany, they're, you know, no nuclear. They still have that idea. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of new technologies involved, especially with these SMRs, these smaller units that are uh, easier to build, faster to build, permitting's easier to do because a lot of these big nuclear projects you have to understand the timeline involved is very long just from getting a permit right so um you've got permitting issues got build time you've got you know so these projects often take 10 to 15 years um for these large-scale products to go from concept to uh, functionality um so i think with these newer technologies we'll be able to cut those lead times you know in half or, you know, by a third. Um, and so I think that would be, that's very good news for the industry. And, you know, people should take a look at that technology. Um, and then before I let you go, uh, Tracy, I, I just like, you know, in, in just in seeing the the attention that se several commodities markets have, have gotten, mostly energy, but, you know, you know, uh, grains have been hot, metals at, at certain points, uh, softs are hot. Um, and seeing the attention that that is that is growing to these markets, does any part of you like give pause? Like, obviously, there are, as we discussed, those long term fundamental uh, tailwinds uh, for oil. But like, does any part of you sort of like give pause and worry that like you know, people may be putting the cart before the horse, or 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 you don't pay attention to like to like hype? I I don't really pay attention to hype, and obviously, yeah. commodities have always been a very volatile trade, right? Sure. So you're gonna have you know ups and downs no matter what but i do think if we're looking at commodities in general we're heading into an area of scarcity right and that's mostly because we've just been underfunded right and we're looking at these big changes in technology and these big aspirations for these 2030 goals 2050 goals now whether we can hit them or not is a totally different story that's like another conversation for another day because i could talk about that for an hour but the fact is is that if that even if we merely get a part of the push that they want towards that yep. we're going to need a lot more of everything so um again you know it's it's a very volatile trade regardless it has its ups and downs for sure but i think we are headed if you want to call it to a commodity super cycle it just won't be in a straight line obviously i've heard, I've heard that before ian we've heard that before yes we have i've yep. said that right. before i think you said that before <laughs> yeah you've been saying it all right tracy i know you have to go so we'll, we'll let you run uh, everyone uh, tracy chukart if you don't know her founder and uh, ceo and chief market strategist and hilltower resource advisors find her on the Twitter machine at shy girl. I'll drop the link. The link is in the description, but I'll drop it in the chat. And uh, Tracy, a pleasure to chat with you as always. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you so much.
See you next time. All right. Ian, um, I think that's a good place for us to wrap. Do you have any final thoughts on anything we just discussed? No, I'm just really grateful that Tracy joined us today. That was lots of fun. Uh, if I think I think the reason that Tracy joined us because someone said a while ago, you know, we should we should get more guests on, and, and I thought of her. But if if anyone watching has any ideas for guests, people we should talk to, let us know. Drop their name in the chat, and uh, we will uh, do our best to get them on the show. So, with that being said, that's a wrap for us today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back Wednesday, 11:30 a.m. Eastern Time. Stay tuned for that. Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for watching.